more than one Christian has stumbled over Hebrews chapter 6. Listen up, zombies. Yeah. Yeah. Would you consider yourself to be a good apple? So you're Oprah. Yeah. <laughs> to me, you're white. Am I wrong? I mean, if you see white, <laughs> work on your kids. They're going to need it. That's not love that's in the air. You can't out sin God's grace. Hello, and welcome to Wretched. My name is Todd Friel. I am your host. The wretch the song refers to. Uh, can a Christian lose his or her salvation? One moment, having repented and put their trust in Jesus Christ, they're on a highway to heaven, but then they backslide and they're going to spend eternity in a lake of sulfur. Can that happen? Invariably, the section of scripture that most people would run to to support the idea of a Christian losing his or her faith would be Hebrews chapter 6, and I grant you, it looks like a Christian can lose their salvation until you remember a key hermeneutical word, context. When you and I fail to remember context, Inevitably, we're going to read a Bible verse and we're going to go, well, there it is. It's really, really clear. But when we read all around it, it brings clarity to a verse that seems a little bit confusing. Uh, it is my contention that too many Christians are miserable, lacking assurance because of Hebrews chapter 6. And too many people are using Hebrews chapter 6 to say, don't you backslide. Because if you do, you could be a Christian one minute and then a child of the devil the next. Let us take a very careful look at Hebrews chapter 6 and see if that is what it is teaching. Because I would like to suggest to you emphatically, it is not. Let's read through that text. Hebrews chapter 6. Therefore, hmm, what's that therefore, therefore? Leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity. Not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings, laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. This will do if God permits. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who he must be talking about Christians, not so fast, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, that sounds like a Christian, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away. Here it is. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance. Before we finish the verse, let's be clear about this. If those preceding verses were talking about a Christian who has been a partaker of the heavenly gift and then loses it, then indeed that person has no hope in the future. They're done. They can't get saved again if... Hebrews 6, 1 through 4, if that's what it's talking about, if, back to our text, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Now an analogy. For ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it was also tilled, receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, sound like a parable? It is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. Sounds like a Christian who lost his or her faith and now is going to be burned. What is our key hermeneutical word? Context, context, context. That's what the therefore is there for in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. What are the preceding five chapters about in the book of Hebrews? If we don't remember that, I agree with you. We're going to read Hebrews chapter 6 and say that's talking about a Christian who loses his faith and now he has no hope he's going to hell. But when we remember the first five chapters, to whom the author of Hebrews is writing, I think it tells a different story. To whom is the author of Hebrews writing? Three groups of people. He's addressing Hebrews, people who are well acquainted with the Old Testament, and they appear to be in some sort of Christian community, but 
it's very clear as you read through the book of Hebrews, he's addressing three types of Hebrews. The first is the individual who is genuinely saved. You see those verses? You are saved. You have repented. You are going to heaven. But then there's a second group. You, you're, you've been enlightened. You know what the Bible is about. You know the teachings about Jesus. You've seen the power of miracles and the power of the word preached. But you're not saved. And the third group is even worse. You kind of got one foot in and one foot out. The first group of people saved. The second groups of people, the second and third group, they're not saved. That raises the question, to which group of people is he talking about in Hebrews chapter 6 Verses 1 through 3. I think our text will make it clear when we remember what the therefore is therefore. Uh, what had the author of Hebrews been writing about in the first five chapters? That Jesus is better than what? He's better than angels. He's better than that high priest Melchizedek. He's better than all the priests. He's better than the Sabbath. It was a it was a type. Remember types and shadows? We talk about this in Jesus Unmasked, that in the Old Testament, it's a hall of mirrors reflecting Jesus. That there are fuzzy pictures of physical things like the Sabbath or the tabernacle that were pictures to point us to Jesus. All throughout the first five chapters, the author is saying, in the Old Testament, there were fuzzy pictures. The ark, the manna, the tabernacle, the Sabbath, the festivals, all of those things were fuzzy pictures that should be pointing like a spotlight ahead. Hey, there's a better thing coming. There's a fulfillment coming. Jesus Christ is coming. That's what the therefore is there for. If you and I forget what the author was talking about, we are not going to understand those verses. And I fear it has been the shipwreck of way too many Christians. When we come back on Wretched... Now that we've set the table, we're going to make our way through these verses. And you, I hope, are not only going to be encouraged, and you're going to conclude, if I'm saved, I can't lose my faith. But more than that, if you're not saved, these verses are actually for you. Next on Wretched. Today's show is brought to you by Wretched. Producers of Christian media, including Wretched TV and Wretched Radio. DVD and audio resources such as The Biggest Question, Drive-By Theology, Jesus Unmasked, and Biblical Manhood. Wretched's purpose is to equip believers in evangelism, theology, church history, marriage, parenting, and much more. For more information, our website is wretched.tv. Wretched. Amazing grace. Amazing gospel. Can a genuine Christian genuinely lose his or her salvation? Welcome back to our wretched Hebrews chapter 6 verses 1 through 8 has been a stumbling block for far too many Christians who had some sort of religious experience, maybe saved, maybe not, but then went through a season of doubt or sin and then read Hebrews chapter 6 and went, Ah, I can't get saved again. There's nothing I can do about it. I'm without hope. No, you are not. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1 starts out with a therefore. Because Jesus was revealed in the Old Testament to you Hebrews. There were types, there were shadows. Therefore... Don't return to the shadows, he's saying. You have the substance, Jesus. Why would you want to go back to the pictures that pointed to Jesus when you have the real thing? Why would you want to go back into the, well, we don't know for sure what he's like, and we've got to do all of these things, and they're just fuzzy pictures, when you can have the real article, Jesus. Remember, the author of Hebrews was writing at different times inside of the book of Hebrews to three different groups of people. Sometimes he was aiming his remarks at true Christians. In this instance, I contend that he is actually writing to the other two groups of people inside of the church. Both of them are unbelievers, some a little bit more serious, some less so, but both of them not Christians. And Hebrews chapter 6 is addressing them. 
You understand all of this Old Testament stuff. You get all of this. Why would you want to go back? And then he starts to list. Why would you want to go back to repentance from dead works, faith toward the Father? Why would you want to go back to ceremonial washings, to the laying on of hands, to the resurrection and judgment, things in the Old Testament? Why, why would you want to go back to this? You need to move forward. That's what he's saying, not to people who are saved, but to people who are not. So here's the structure. Therefore... I want you to do something and not go back. And he lists these six things. Let's make our way through these first few verses with all of this in mind. And I think you're going to conclude, hey, he's not talking to Christians at all. Instead, he's talking about people who need to get saved. Let's make our way through Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, and we know what the therefore is there for because Jesus is better leaving, now this, this isn't forsaking, it's not never remembering again, but moving forward the elementary teachings, specifically the oracles of God in the Old Testament. You know all of those things. We don't want to abandon those. We don't want to tear out our Old Testament and never read it, but we're going to move forward from that. That's the starting place. Now we're going to move toward something. And where does the author want these people to go? Let us press on to maturity. This is a phrase that does not mean to become more theologically wise or more sanctified. It's written in the passive tense, which means let us be carried on to salvation. In other words, to those two groups of people who weren't believers in the church, you understand the Old Testament. That's a good place to start, but we're moving forward, and you need to move into the direction of salvation. You've got to get saved now that you get that. Don't go back there. Don't live there because you like the smells of the sacrifices or because everybody in your village, they're all into the same customs. You've got to leave that and get saved. Let us be carried to salvation, not laying again a foundation. In other words, not going back to the types and shadows of the Old Testament, not going back to the pictures of Jesus. We're not going, we've done that already. We're not going back there. And now he lists all of those types and shadows that he's referring to, that list of six. We're not going back to repentance from dead works. This could be a couple of things. It could be the Old Testament commands to be pure. You're not going back there. Or it could be their attitude, if I do good works, that's going to save me. No, they lead to death. We're not going back to trying to do stuff, to going back to the ceremonies, to going back to thinking we can earn our way to heaven. We're not going back there. He continues. And of faith toward God. Who is he referring to in the oracles of God? Well, he's returning, if you will, referring, if you will, to the Father. We're not just going back to understanding the Father. We now understand really clearly the picture's been made clear. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's not go back there. The Father is revealed through the Son. It continues. Let's not go back to instruction about washings. This is written in the plural. This is not referring to individual baptism in order to get regenerated. This is referring to ceremonial washings. When you read through Leviticus, all this, do you want to be clean? You sinned, you got to do this. You sinned, you got to do that to be ceremonially clean. We're not going back there. We've got Jesus who made us clean. He continues with the list and the laying on of hands. Well, you know what that's referring to, the Day of Atonement, when the priest would lay his hands ceremonially, symbolically, onto the, onto the sheep or onto the ram, transferring the sins of the people to the animal as a picture of a lamb sacrifice to come who would take away the sins of the world. Don't go back there. Don't go back to doing that. That was just a picture of the Lamb of God. All of those lamb sacrifices, they were pointing toward the fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Why would you want to go back there? And then two more in his list. And the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. What was he saying here and to whom was he saying it? Almost certainly to the Pharisees who had gleaned from the Old Testament. There's a resurrection and there's a judgment to come. You, you Pharisees who love your Old Testament, you're not saved. 
you need to be carried on toward salvation. He's not talking to people who are saved who can lose it. He's talking to people who have never got it, who need to get it. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what about verses 4 through 8? When he talks about people who are enlightened, they've tasted of the heavenly gift, they've been partakers and they've tasted. That sure seems like he's talking about Christians. Well, hold on. Verses 4 through 8 and verses 1 through 3. Did you notice we're missing verse 3? Here's what it says. And this we will do if God permits. Next. Oh, see what I did there? I'm wretched. Turn on the evening news, if you dare, and you'll notice the world is in sorry shape. War, divorce, violence, and immorality. The thought of preaching the gospel to this sin-sick world is nothing short of terrifying. If you're like most of us, you'd rather not confront the darkness. That's why Wretched produces DVDs like Terrified 2 and Wretched Radio and Wretched TV. Wretched. Amazing grace. Amazing gospel. You cannot lose your salvation, and Hebrews chapter 6 proves it. Welcome back to Wretched. Taking a look at a very, what appears to be a confusing section of Scripture, Hebrews chapter 6, which is built on Hebrews chapter 1 through 5, types and shadows of Jesus in the Old Testament. Now that you get that all of those things in the Old Testament were pointing to Jesus in the New, now... You need to leave those things behind, never forgetting them, but you're going to press on toward salvation in the one to whom those types and shadows pointed. Uh, that is what Hebrews 6 is teaching. But I know the challenge of this because the verses continue from 4 through 8, and it talks about this same group of people. You're enlightened. You, you've tasted the heavenly gift. You've been partakers of the Holy Spirit. You've tasted of the Word of God, and you think... Well, that really sounds like Christians not so fast. Remember our first few verses here. He's telling them, press on to salvation. Press on to the fulfillment. Press on to the substance. Press on to the real. Press on to Jesus. Press on to resting from your works. You people who are inside of the church, you two groups of people, you're kind of convinced, but not totally, and you're not really, but maybe just a little bit, you need to get saved. Now, with that context, let us tackle verses 4 through 8, which appear to be talking to Christians. Here we go. This is verse 4 of Hebrews 6. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened, uh, specifically, they've been made aware. They've been informed, but didn't act on it. For instance, if I said to you, there's a really big sale going on at Target, you've been enlightened. But if you don't go to Target and participate in the deals, well, you knew about it, but you didn't move into, if you will, belief. And the Bible talks about this regularly. Do you remember all of the people who followed Jesus? And the Bible said they believed, but Jesus didn't entrust himself to them because they didn't really believe because the Bible talks about spurious faith, different types of faith. Do you remember the soil, the parable of the soils? That there are some people they receive, they've been enlightened, but then they, they go, the cares of the world, they get busy with stuff. They don't put their hand on the plow. They want to go back and bury the dead. They want to go back and finish taking care of the land. They were never really saved, even though they were enlightened. Uh, he continues to that group of people, you've tasted of the heavenly gift. Remember, tasting is temporary. Like Jesus, he tasted of death. Okay, you've heard preaching, you've tasted it, but it didn't last. Like Jesus dying, he rose from the dead. And have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. In other words, they've seen the power of the Holy Spirit manifested. Yeah, that looks good, I like that. Sort of like Simon Magus back in Acts chapter 8, who wanted to purchase the Holy Spirit, but he was revealed as a false convert. That's who he's talking to here, not believers. It continues, and you've tasted the good word of God. Like Herod, Herod loved to hear the preaching of John the Baptist. 
He tasted the good word of God. He listened to sermons. But he sure didn't get saved. Clearly, the author here is not talking to genuine converts. He's talking about people on the fringes, checking it out. The people who are, hmm, I'm considering Christianity. That's who he's talking to. It continues, you've tasted of the powers of the age to come. In other words, they've witnessed miracles. What were miracles for? To attest to the preaching of the preacher. You see a miracle and somebody preached the word of God and it's a genuine miracle, you have no finer proof. This is what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 12, 22. The people who saw him do miracles and then said, eh, I think that comes from Satan. Jesus said, you've committed the sin against the Holy Spirit. And he warns them, don't be that guy or gal. Verse 6, and then you fall away from the fringes. It is impossible, just like it's impossible for God to lie, not a possibility. It's impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. This is the person who has all the knowledge and proof needed and says, I don't think so. You are without hope. And for you, you have hardened your heart and, and you can look forward to not getting saved again because you were never saved in the first place. You had every opportunity, everything available to you and you said, no, it is impossible for you to get saved. And the writer now concludes with a warning to that group of people. And I wonder if this warning is for you. For ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed and it ends up being burned. To you people who have been partakers, you've been enlightened, you've had the rain fall on you, maybe you kind of started and started to produce a little bit of fruit, but you fall away, you have nothing but anticipation of eternal fire. Don't be that guy. Don't be that gal. If you have repented and put your trust in Jesus Christ, you are saved and you cannot get yourself unsaved. But if these verses are talking to you, you get it, you understand it, and you reject it, please flee from the wrath that is to come before it is too late. Repent and put your trust in the substance Jesus Christ today and he will save you forever. And until tomorrow, Go serve your king.